This is Keys to the Shop, episode 154, Decoding Decaf, with Mike Strump of Swiss Water Decaffeinated Coffee. Hey everybody, and welcome to another episode of Keys to the Shop, where we give you insights, inspiration, and the tools you need to grow as a coffee service professional. My name is Chris DeFirio. I'm your host for the show. It's an honor to be with you today. Thank you for tuning in. And really quick, if you have not yet subscribed to Keys to the Shop, I would encourage you to hit the subscribe button wherever you uh, get your podcasts. That way you'll never miss an episode. Also, uh, if you have the opportunity to uh, rate or review this show on iTunes, that would be amazing as well. Thank you so much to those of you who have already done so. Um, I'm really looking forward to this episode. A dear and old friend of mine, Mike Strumpf uh, from Swisswater Decaf, has joined us to talk about this very important subject that we really need to embrace as a specialty community more uh, as our customers embrace it more. So uh, we're going to learn a lot for sure. Now, I want you to know that this episode is brought to you by the wonderful folks at Prima Coffee. Prima Coffee is one of the best specialty coffee equipment suppliers out there. They curate the top equipment from around the world to fit perfectly with the needs of both their commercial and enthusiast customers. They're really all about helping you succeed in making great coffee at home or in the shop. Um, it's what drives them. So if you're just trying to set up a great home bar, they got you covered. Or if you're trying to outfit a shop or many shops, they also have you covered. They really uh, take pride in having the expertise and the know-how to get you the exact right thing for whatever your situation is. I would encourage you to go to Prima dash coffee.com and see what they have to offer. Learn more there about the equipment. They have a lot of resources and guides that you can uh, freely watch and read. They do a fantastic job in this and they'll do a fantastic job for you too. So I encourage you go to prima-coffee.com, reach out to them via email or phone, let them know the keys to the shop sent you. And uh, thank you so much Prima for your support of keys to the shop. This episode is also brought to you by the Pacific Barista Series. This is a line of plant-based performance beverages that are designed specifically for professional baristas and the standards of excellence that they demand from their products. So whether you're talking about um, oat milk, almond, soy, coconut, or rice, the ability for these beverages to take the heat from steaming, produce an unmatched silky texture, and keep the flavor balance focused on coffee makes it a perfect choice for your cafe's menu. You can make latte art with these all day long. They are just amazing to work with. And Pacific is amazing to work with because they give back so much to the community and they work hard to support the specialty community globally. These products are developed alongside baristas and uh, made for baristas. So this is just a testimony to that fact. So I would encourage you to go to pacificfoods.com, look into the barista series line of plant-based performance beverages, and see how adding this to your cafe's menu can really help elevate the non-dairy experience that your customers have at your shop. Thank you very much, Pacific, for your support of Keys to the Shop. All right, so today we are going to be talking about decaf coffee. Um, you know, when I first started out in coffee, to talk about drinking decaf coffee was uh, almost like sacrilege. You didn't want to talk about it, and um, if you did drink it, you weren't going to brag about it. And and I feel like over the years, as, as we've progressed as an industry, and I think we've matured as an industry, uh, we have embraced decaf more, and that's great. But, you know, some of the mystery about decaf still lingers, and some of the old thoughts about decaf still linger. And uh, this episode is really going to dive into the subject and help us understand what happens in the decaffeination process and what has changed in decaf over the years that really makes this a specialty product right on par with the coffees that we offer our customers, uh, no matter the hopper you're looking at on the bar. Um, you know, customers are just drinking decaf more and more. I am, you know, I'm drinking decaf more and more myself. Um, and I'm so glad for companies like Swiss Water who have such a dedication to quality. And I'm especially glad that they have somebody with such a, a mind and a palate for quality like Mike Strumpf. 
Mike is the director of coffee for Swiss Water Decaffeinated Coffee, and he has a really impressive list of coffee credentials. He is a licensed Q grader and the educational coordinator for the Canadian chapter of the Specialty Coffee Association. Um, He is both an authorized SCA trainer in green coffee and sensory. He's a member of the Coffee Skills Program, Green Coffee Creators Group, Mike is also a past chair of the SCA Barista Competitions Group, and he is a head judge for the World Barista Championships. Mike has been roasting coffee since 2004, and you've definitely tasted his work if you've uh, got coffee from any of the fine folks at Intelligentsia Coffee or Allegro Coffee Company. I've known Mike for a long time, and he is definitely one of the industry's most intelligent thoughtful, and skillful coffee professionals. And in this conversation, he is going to guide us to a greater understanding of um, decaf, both in the processing of it, its evolution, and some practical tips on how to really get the most out of our decaf coffee in the roaster and on the bar. So I'm excited to share this with you. Here now is my conversation with the incredible Mike Strumpf of Swiss Water Decaffeinated Coffee. Well, hello, Mike. Welcome to Keys to the Shop. Great to talk to you today. You as well. Thank you. Well, how's it up there in Canada right now? Currently, it is beautiful spring weather, which uh, we in Vancouver get a lot of rain. And so when it's not a rainy day, everybody's extremely happy. Nice. Nice. Are you <laughs> drinking some decaf for our interview today? I am drinking caffeinated coffee. We cup all of our decaffeinated coffees, though we're a normal office and our plant runs 24 hours a day. So there's uh, honestly a lot of caffeinated coffee that gets drunk here. No doubt, no doubt. Um, well, we're going to be diving deep into the decaf coffee here. Um, I-, I wonder if you can uh, just elaborate a little bit about um, what it is that you do specifically with Swiss water. Sure. So my title is director of coffee, which uh, people have at all kinds of coffee companies, and it means something different to all of them. So I am responsible for sourcing coffee and overseeing the quality assurance of coffee that we buy and coffee that we decaffeinate. And then also internal education about decaffeination and coffee in general, education to our customers, interfacing with the industry. It's a wide-reaching role. Primarily my job is buy coffee, drink coffee. So quality control and then sort of well, kind of kind of marketing, uh, relationship building. And yeah. uh, how, how has that been going? How long have you been doing that role? Let's start there. I've been at Swiss Water for eight and a half years. Mm. And before Swiss Water, I worked for roasting companies. And I was a customer of Swiss Waters and uh, of other decaffeinators as well. Um, but it I still remember what it was like not being at Swiss Water, though obviously if you're anywhere with a company for eight years, you're going to get blinders on it <laughs> in <some> capacity. <laughs> you forget your former life in those roasteries. It just, it's all Swiss Water now. You lose perspective, most definitely. You get used to what you do and how you do it, and it's tough to know how other people work. You know, with roasted coffee, if you want to know what another roaster's coffee tastes like, you just you'll make an order and it's no big deal. But when you're working in green coffee, getting samples from another trading house or from another decaffeinator isn't necessarily so easy. So it's harder to find out what somebody else's Guatemalan coffee tastes like than if you were just a roaster and you wanted to find out what the roaster down the street was doing. Okay. So you got to hunt extra hard to get perspective of where you're uh, standing is in, in calibration with the rest of the industry that offers similar products. Yeah, it's not impossible. It just takes a little bit extra work. Mm. So when you were uh, yet working for roasteries and you were a customer of Swiss Water, you're, you're, I mean, you've been in coffee for quite a long time. And I imagine that your perception of, of decaf has changed over the years and especially since you've been working at Swiss Water, could you tell us a little bit about uh, your perception of decaf coffee um, before Swiss Water and and after? How how has it changed? Yeah, for sure, it's changed for me personally, and I think it's changed in the industry. I think they're almost connected, coming from the same point of view of people maturing and uh, looking back at 
when I came into coffee and then the years afterward, there were a lot of new people, a lot of new excitement, a lot of new companies and strong opinions. And people were basing their marketing and their decisions on, you know, taking a stand on something and not necessarily so much listening to what customers want, but putting forth what they wanted to project. And I, I don't run a company, but I imagine you have to make tough decisions. You have to decide how you want to market yourself. And taking a firm stand is very nice, but I think that the industry has kind of softened from that and has found a better balance between wanting to show that you are an expert and have strong feelings that separates you from every other company, but also trying to please people. And in that, is trying to please people who want something other than fully caffeinated coffee. It's so easy to, to think about. And probably a lot of us have done it. Like you're working in a cafe and you're, you're getting your grinders ready in the morning and you just overlook the decaf grinder. <laughs> and cause that's, you know, you're short on time. You think about what's the most important thing, but these little systematic things that everybody kind of does leads to, a lower quality kind of forgotten decaf. But now that people are paying more attention to what customers want, customer loyalty, especially with how much data we have, you know, people are analyzing which customers come back. Um, the decaf customers are extremely loyal. So it's worth paying attention to those sorts of things. So I think in the industry, people have really softened the idea of pleasing what their customers want and working for it. For me personally, it is my day in and day out, and I have a hard time working somewhere that I don't really believe in what's happening. And so when I came to Swiss Water, it was right after a bunch of changes in the process, which really unlocked capabilities of producing better coffee. Uh, even that old Swiss Water was like, you could buy coffees from different countries, but they all tasted pretty much the same. It didn't matter whether it was from Colombia or from Ethiopia or from Sumatra. They all just kind of tasted homogenous. Mm. But uh, about a year and a half before I started there, there were a bunch of process improvements that were made. The, the process was torn apart, analyzed, and a bunch of new control systems were put into place, which allows us to produce coffees that are much more true to the flavors of the origin of the coffee before decaffeination. And so that, having come here, did change my perspective on decaf. Admittedly, I was one of the people roasting coffee who didn't pay that much attention to roasting decaf and thought, oh, I better put a lot of roast development on here because it's got to taste like something. <laughs> and that's really changed uh, in my perspective because, you know, day in and day out when we're doing quality assurance, we're, we're testing the coffee before decaffeination side by side with the coffee after decaffeination and it's at a super light sample roast level and it's still full flavored there's nothing that you have to cover up or make up for so that's really changed for me over the years mm. you, you know i think i can sense that same thing shifting in the quality of decaf available is is strikingly uh better than it used to be and the decisions that people made to overlook decaf down to the grinders that we buy to grind decaf we spend a ton of money on like a mythos or a peak and they were like well we can get the super jolly <laughs> for the for the decaf um you know or whatever grinder is the cheapest one because you know who cares is sort of the underlying thought but as as we start to see a little bit more nuance, you're right. I mean, I've I've totally noticed that, and and I don't know. You know, I'm I'm a little bit older now, and when I started in coffee, and I want more decaf coffee. I don't. It's like just my physiology says, hey, just stop it with the caffeine right now. Uh, and so maybe there's something to do with that too, as as the industry ages, literally ages. Um, but I I wonder. You said something about how a year and a half before you started, they tore apart the process. And not a lot of companies would take time to do that. What was the catalyst for that, I wonder? Was it just feedback from customers about the sort of monotoned, uh, monoflavor that you described earlier? Feedback from customers, 
but also differentiation um, and trying to change the face of what decaf is because everybody was producing decaf that just tasted decaf. Uh, decaffeination industry is tough. It's part of why you don't see a lot of new companies coming up. It's not an easy one to get into and it's not an easy one to differentiate yourself in. The goal for Swiss Water has been to focus on being a coffee company that represents the flavor of coffee and the origin of the coffee, not to do all the other stuff. You know, we, we even don't capture our caffeine and process that down. So we focus just on the coffee. And so we needed to figure out how to do that better. And um, I wasn't here at the time, but it must have taken a lot of humility to say we're not doing a good job. But what we did was in that, in that process control evaluation, we're using the Six Sigma methodology mm -hmm. of putting in control systems, measuring, analyzing, diagnosing, and repeating that process over and over. And it took years to, to get to a really good point. And it's still, it's a daily thing. That's the way Six Sigma works is you can never stop. You're analyzing this data. And if you get to a steady level where you're doing a very good job, you need to put in new measures that show that you're not doing a good enough job. <laughs> wow. It's, it's a, a little self-punishment there, but it, it just yeah. ever, ever improving. Yeah. So when you are looking at what you're going to offer on the market now, right into the core of your role in procuring coffees to decaffeinate, I, I mean, is that how it works? So you go to importers and look for offerings that have particular traits or fit a pre-prescribed um, array of offerings that you want to have available to customers and you say, okay, well, we need an African or we need a, a Colombian or Brazil. What are what are the things, the boxes that you have to tick to know that you've got a, a full spectrum that satisfies Swiss Water's standards for that we have a good good family of products here to, to offer customers? Yeah, that's a great and complex question. Because uh, I, I think about roasters as uh, people who really want control. If you didn't want control, you would just buy your coffee from someone else. So roasters really want to know where's my coffee coming from and all these different things. But they have to put their trust in someone. It's either put your trust in an importer for helping you source coffee or you go down to the country of origin and source for yourself and you have to decide what's your level of being comfortable. And unless your company is so big as a roaster that you can send your own coffee to be decaffeinated, you have to put your trust in a decaffeinator for sourcing coffee for you. And so we have a wide range of coffees trying to please as many people as we can. Um, going from non-traceable, very value focused coffees to highly traceable, high cup quality coffees, and then everything in between. And with all those, we make the decision if we're offering uh, Columbia Excelso, just not like coffee with too much traceability. It's kind of just uh, your generic Colombian coffee flavor. We have to decide what's that flavor that we want. And so we have a target flavor for each country that we think typifies what we want to represent from Colombia or from Guatemala. And then we buy to that. Luckily, we do a pretty good job with our process of maintaining the flavor. So we don't have to think about like, what's this coffee going to translate into as a decaf? Because we know it will hold up. So we just buy what coffee do we think typifies that profile that we want from that country. There's a sort of mysterious middle ground where a roaster would look at that coffee and say, well, I, based on what I've, I know about this coffee from you know, being green, then going right into my roaster, uh, I'm going to expect these characteristics. But on, on your end, now you're putting it through a process that augments those particular flavor compounds. And, and um, have you, is it just through experience that you know that based on your process, it's going to translate to these characteristics that might be slightly different than what you would if get if it's not decaffeinated? Yeah, we every single day that I've worked here, we cup the production runs of decaf. So I have a, a lot of experience under my belt of, of cupping these coffees. And in general, we just look for the same flavor profile that we want coming out. 
there's minor variations that happen every single time. Our decaffeination process is run by people. It's a, a batch system similar to a roaster where we have a control system in place to give visibility as to like uh, temperatures and flow rates like a roaster would, but every, every coffee is started and finished by our operators. So there are small variations from here to there, but in general, we don't have to think so much about what will this turn like as a decaf. It's just, what does it taste like now? Mm. Okay. Excellent. So when we're talking about the flavors that you offer to customers, they come to you and say, well, well, we're looking for a decaf. Do you ask like, well, what flavors are you interested in your decaf tasting like? Yeah, definitely. Because we have coffees from many different countries, continents, and processing methods. We operate very similar to what a roaster would operate like in terms of buying coffee or what a, an importer would operate like in terms of selling coffee. Yeah, let's dive into the process a little bit. Um when we talk about Swiss water, now this this new and improved process, you get a coffee in that you really like. You want to save the nuances of this coffee as much as you can through this process. What does the coffee go through in, in the Swiss water process? Yeah. So I'll explain decaffeination in general, and then I'll explain the details of the Swiss water process. Because all decaffeination works in approximately the same way. You get your green coffee. You have to hydrate it because it'll make it easier to remove the caffeine. So you either hydrate with water or with steam. Then you put your beans into a decaffeination medium. And the main methods of decaffeination are either through chemical solvents such as ethyl acetate or methylene chloride or non-chemical solvents such as water or carbon dioxide. So you put your coffee into the medium, caffeine will go from the beans into the medium. Then a next step will be done to remove the caffeine from that decaffeination medium. You then dry your beans down and you just do the same thing over and over. Every decaffeination process works like that. The differences are how you, how you hydrate your beans, what your decaffeination medium is, and then how you take the caffeine out. So here at Swiss Water, we hydrate with water as opposed to hydrating with steam. Our decaffeination medium, we call it green coffee extract, though that's just uh, our marketing name for it. What it is, is a water solution that is saturated with the soluble solids of green coffee. So let's say Arabica coffee is about 26% soluble solids. We have water with about 26% soluble solids in there. Now the exact solids don't exactly matter. What's important is that there's an equilibrium then we have to create a deficiency. So we need that extract to not have caffeine in it. We call the extract green coffee extract. When it has no caffeine in it, we call it lean green coffee extract, <laughs> non-caffeine. So then when you put your green beans into that, the flavor soluble solids are at equilibrium. We just create an environment to remove the caffeine. So the flavor stays in the beans, caffeine essentially brews into the green coffee extract. So the coffee goes from high caffeine to low caffeine. The green coffee extract goes from lean to rich, full of caffeine. And then we wanna reuse that extract over and over. So then what really makes us different from other decaffeinators is this next step. Whereas, uh, you know, a lot of decaffeinators could say they use water. I would, I would venture to say that every decaffeinator uses water at some point in their process whether it's for hydrating or for moving products around, whatever it is, everybody uses water. So just the description of water process is a bit misleading. What really makes differentiation between decaffeinators is how you take the caffeine out of your medium. And what we do is we use carbon. It's made specifically for us. And uh, what it is is it, it allows us to have a chemical free process where the carbon captures the caffeine out of the green coffee extract, it bonds into the carbon, and it doesn't remove the other soluble solids because the carbon's made specifically to the right shape and size to capture the caffeine. Mm -hmm. After that carbon becomes uh, saturated and all the pores are full, we put it into a reactivation furnace. So we burn out 
all the pores of the carbon. The carbon eventually gets a little bit smaller as you do that. But we reuse the carbon over and over until it's too small. Then we get rid of it. It's just a very small amount and then put in fresh carbon. So we're always trying to reuse the green coffee extract and reuse the carbon as much as possible. So this is a filter we're talking about. Yeah, yeah. It's like if you opened up a Brita filter and dumped it out. It's loose granules of carbon. Oh, okay. Great. So that's just a slurry that's attracting all of that caffeine to itself while it's in that now rich green extract. Yeah. Okay. And then we dry the coffee down. Most people don't like to talk about coffee drying at origin or in decaffeination. It's not a fun thing to talk about. I don't think you can make the coffee any better with this drying, but you can really screw up your coffee as opposed to roasters because we get coffee wet. We have a big risk of mold. So we have to make sure that we're drying our coffee evenly so that it's not wet on the inside and dry on the outside or wet on the outside and dry on the inside. And we also have to make it stable because the coffee has been put through a lot with the hydration and the removing and the drying down. So it's very likely to give off moisture and take on moisture. And we know that when those fluctuations happen, the quality of coffee degrades quite quickly. So at the end of drying, you also have to stabilize your coffee. So it's a complex process that people don't like to talk about because it's not fun, but it's a very necessary thing to do. <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> and the coffee's the coffee's really uh, exposed too. There's no parchment on there, and we don't have patios, so <laughs> it's it's mechanical drying, and it's uh, it's a bit rushed compared to what you would be used to, like down in coffee origin countries. Mechanical drying, as in it's tumbled or. Uh, is a heat applied in the process? We don't use a tumbler like a Guardiola. We have a, it's a flat um, mechanical bed. So the coffee's moving down a bed uh, and it's dried through hot forced air. Mm -hmm. So you're trying to push off the moisture from about 50% down to about 10%. And you just resaturate and go through that whole process again, extracting it into the slurry removing the caffeine and drying it down. How many, how many cycles does that take? Well, we won't dry it down until the coffee's decaffeinated ah, okay. fully. So, and it's not a, it's not a number of cycles so much as it's based on time. Uh, we have a really ingenious method of monitoring the caffeine content online. So we can see when the coffee is decaffeinated to the right level and we take it offline, put it into the dryer. Mm, just like a, a probe in a roaster. Yeah. Okay. And so now you've got this coffee and you're you're storing it, I imagine. Now that it's dry, you can put it right into the bag that it's shipped in, right? So we we have a stabilization time. We let the coffee sit before it's bagged up because if we put it out in the into the environment, it'll just give up its moisture too quickly. So we stabilize and then we bag it. We primarily bag into fresh jute bags. Uh, we don't know where the jute bags have been, how they've been handled. Um, and it also looks pretty nice when all the bags look exactly the same. So we put it on there. We stencil on the, the necessary information, like where the coffee's from, uh, production information so that the bags are traceable, whatever other things people want on there. Uh, but primarily we put it into fresh jute bags um, or some people want Green Pro liners, we're happy to do that to extend the life of the coffee. Well, we're, we try and be very flexible and amenable. So after it's stabilized, it's it's not uh, Green Pro is not going to run the risk, even though it's a super closed environment as opposed to jute. It's not going to run the risk of of the mold or the the moisture and uh, being you know, changing the coffee in any way. No, not as long as the coffee was dried and stabilized. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about that a little bit, the stabilization of the coffee, because, you know, in the talking, in the description of the process, you were talking about how it goes through a lot. And this is the main thing that I think we notice on the bar about decaf is that, for, well, first of all, the, the bean itself looks different. It's much darker. And when you're giving roastery tours, you always say, and this is decaf. No, it's not roasted. Um, it's <laughs> It's just darker because of this this process i guess it's its original uh, pigments have been lost in the in the process is that what happens to it with our process i don't think of it 
so much as losing pigment as gaining pigment. Mm. And that's exactly how I describe it, just like you did. Um, our green coffee extract is this dark green color. It, it's just like it's super rich with, with solids of green coffee. And so the outside of the bean gets a little stained. But what you have to pay attention to is the color of the ground coffee. So when we look at analyzing roast color, instead of just looking at the external color, we want to look at the ground color that we're taking a sample of. Because then you can match up the color of the decaf to, say, whatever color you roast your other coffee to. So if you use a color track or an agtron, we try and talk to everybody about the, the color of the ground coffee instead of the color of the whole bean coffee. So what is the um, most dramatic physical change that the coffee undergoes during this process? Because it just behaves differently on the bar. And baristas oftentimes don't like working with decaf because it doesn't react to the same um, methods that they use for regular coffee. Uh, what, what What's behind that? My take on it is that the pores have been opened up and then reset. And they don't necessarily reset in the exact same way. You'll never have it come back exactly the same. And so it's easier for transfer of oxygen and solids out of the coffee since it's been opened up and then put back together. So that means that decaf green coffee will age faster. And it also means that decaf roasted coffee will degas faster. And what we've found in, in testing is that it's easier to extract soluble solids from roasted decaf. So like your soluble solids will come out from the bean faster in the beginning of a brew or in the beginning of an extraction than it will with a non-decaffeinated coffee. Does it produce more fines in the grinder as well? No, it doesn't. Interesting. It just is easier to take out the soluble solids. That's see now that that's something that I've always thought when grinding decaf is that it seems like it just it is a lot more talcumy than the rest of the you know other grinds that I'm using. Now I, I won't I can't say across the board across other decaffeinators, but with ours in the testing that we've done, the the particle analysis, uh, the particle distribution comes out pretty similar between before and decaffeination of the same coffee. Uh, but it's, it is, it's going to be different. And that's only if you're roasting to the exact same roast level. What we often see is that roasters will roast their decafs to a slightly darker, deeper development level, which we know will lead to more fines. Uh, that's a great point. Okay. So something in the roasting possibly behind that. Now, I, I want to talk a little bit about working with decaf as we've just touched on this. Um, we've got this high quality decaf in our hands and we want to do, uh, we want to do our best to bring out the best in this decaf. Um, in the roasting process, what do you think is the most, uh, what do you think is the best practice for roasting decaf? Maybe different or slightly different techniques than roasting regular coffee. So first off is to not use it as your warm up coffee. <laughs> <laughs> That's the number one first tip that you have to give. After that, you just have to pay attention to the same things that you would pay attention with any coffee, but you have different set points. As we were talking about, the color is different in the beginning. And so our decaf is a slightly darker green. Some other decafs might be a little brownish or a little mottled, whatever they are. You have to like take a snapshot of that as opposed to what coffee would look like if it was just normal green coffee. So paying attention to the bean probe is really important because you can get thrown off by the appearance of the coffee. And I think that the real big thing to pay attention to with F roasting is after you go through the drying phase, once you're around first crack to the end of that, once the coffee turns from endothermic to exothermic is where I see the biggest difference. 
uh, because the coffee's been opened up and brought back down, it doesn't hold energy quite the same way as a really dense coffee would, even if it's from a dense coffee origin, like a, a high grown Ethiopian coffee. Once it's been opened up and processed, it's not going to hold heat the same way. So you have to approach the end of the roast a little bit differently. The coffee won't be giving off as much energy, but you also can't give it too much energy because it can get away really fast. So I think of the end of the roast, I approach it like I would be approaching a coffee that's slightly lower in density, even if the decaf is not a low density decaf. Mm, so it's transformed essentially into something that reacts pretty across the board, almost like a low density coffee, no matter what the origin is. Yes. Yeah. And uh, an interesting thing about our process, and I can't speak for other decaffeinators, but for us, it doesn't matter what moisture content the coffee comes into us or what density the coffee comes into us. We decaffeinate down to the same moisture level. And that's because we have our standards to make sure that we're not producing uh, coffee that could uh, mold up. So we could get a 9% moisture coffee. We could get a 12% moisture coffee. We ship it out as decaf at the same level. Mm -hmm. And so that also creates this level of kind of equalization and change where you can't approach it exactly the same as you would uh, non-processed coffee. Now let's kind of talk about the using of the decaf on the bar. Like mm -hmm. when we get to the grinder, when we get to extracting the coffee, Again, we sort of uh, danced around this a little bit earlier in talking about the freshness of the coffee or how, how fast it degasses. Um, when we've got this decaf in the hopper, what are some things that we need to pay attention to in order to get the most out of it, um, you know, curb our frustration? Because I think we're approaching decaf oftentimes with the exact same tools that we use for other coffees and yeah. maybe running up against a wall where we don't have to. So what are some of those best practices to, to grind and extract decaf to its maximum potential? Yeah, this is great. And I think we're at a really good time in our industry to take this on because we can't treat it exactly the same as every other coffee. One point is using it sooner out of the roaster because it degasses faster you don't really want to be using it seven days to 10 days to 14 days out of the roaster. You could put it in your espresso machine two days out and it's probably going to be degassed enough to create consistent and balanced shots. So that's one really important thing. So I am a big supporter of packaging decaf roasted coffee in smaller sizes. Don't use a five pound bag, keep it smaller so that your coffee stays fresher. Next up, is making sure that you're open to different styles of extraction. Why I think this is such a good time for us to approach this is we now have all these espresso machines that have variable temperatures, variable profiles that we can do. And so you can set up a completely different profile to extract your decaf versus how you would be extracting your caffeinated coffee. Just as you might approach any uh, guest coffee that you have or single origin, whatever it is, you approach each one and you try and figure out how's the profile going to make this coffee come out its best. Do I need to make it hotter? Do I need to make it colder? And decaf's confusing when you're trying to analyze these because if you look and you're measuring TDS, you aren't going to get the same readings. Decaffeinated coffee will start out with lower avail available solids. So you shouldn't aim for the same target TDS because you won't get there. So you have to have a really open mind when you're approaching the profile that you want for either batch brew decaf, pour over decaf, or espresso decaf. And as long as you treat it like a normal coffee and do all of the things, changing the variables that you might, you'll end up with a nice profile. But if you just try and cram it into the existing profile that you have, it's probably not going to bring out the best in that decaf. That's a great point because we are busy on the bar. Oftentimes there's it's, it, it, that afterthought again of, well, we've got recipes for, you know, whatever, uh, our espresso blends and 
we want it to hit those numbers the way that uh, the other ones uh, do. And if it does, then I don't have time to really you know, care that much about it right now. So I'm just going to let it fl fly, you know, it hit all the markers and, you know, geez, it's decaf. So, um, <laughs> there's, there's that, it's such a big, um, a big impediment, sort of a bias to get over in order to invest that kind of attention into decaf. Um, it sounds like we just, we'd need to take that coffee and go through all the processes and contexts that it would, be brewed in, like you said, pour over or espresso and try it in a, a vast range and then identify the tastiest of those things. Yeah. And it's really an important thing to pay attention to because decaf represents about 15% of coffee consumed in the U S and like other than maybe someone's espresso blend, what other single coffee represents 15% of business? That's a great point. So you should pay attention to it. <laughs> the other thing that's really interesting is the changing face of who's drinking decaf and coffee. I think it's really driven by cafe culture and uh, open working spaces and people using cafes as their workspace. If someone's going to be in a cafe for a number of hours, most people can't consume four or five cups of coffee. So decaf drinkers now are younger and younger. And there are people who also drink caffeinated coffee, the old style of like, I just buy my one bag of decaf and that's all I drink. And I've forgotten what caffeinated coffee tastes like. It doesn't exist. So if you dial in your, your caffeinated coffee and it tastes amazing. And then that same customer gets a decaf later in the day and it tastes significantly different. They're going to be disappointed mm -hmm. because it's people drinking the same coffee. So there's nowhere to hide anymore <laughs> no no and considering how many people are drinking decaf uh, it's certainly worth looking into uh, like uh, over the last two years decaf consumption has increased over 42 percent in specialty decaf and so it's really a growing segment again i think driven by uh, by cafe culture which is a great thing because I like good tasting coffee and the more good tasting decaf there is, it's a good thing. I, At least for me. Yeah. That's what I do for me too. Job. Like I, <laughs> I, I crave, like even now we're talking about it. I'm thinking, man, I've had some decaf on the counter. It's late in the afternoon. I really want a good cup of coffee. And if I have a good decaf, that's a lifesaver. And yet still there's this part of me that feels like I have to like augment my voice and squint my eyes when I tell somebody <laughs> that I'm, I'm drinking decaf. And, and so the coffee culture drives what customers think about coffee. Obviously, if we celebrate decaf drinkers and their choices um, and we talk them down from their uh, apologies at the pickup counter, which I you know, still do with people saying, well, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm like, no, no, it's an, an amazing thing that you're drinking decaf. It's a great, we have a great decaf coffee. So it's not a big deal. And, and to your point about that, you all did a pop-up cafe in New York City, right, of all decaf coffee. Yeah, yeah, we did too. And it was we didn't tell people they were decaffeinated coffees. It was just <laughs> for a coffee experience and just showing people that there's nothing wrong with decaffeinated coffee. We try and do some, some fun marketing things. But overall... The way that I see decaf going is exactly what you're saying, is getting rid of that stigma that you have to whisper about it. I still go into lots of cafes where they don't have decaf on the menu, and it's just expected that you see there's an extra grinder, so you know there's decaf there. But if you really want people to not have to whisper about it and to push forward where your decaf is going, you need to treat it like every other coffee. If you know full traceability on where the coffee's from, you know country, region, farm name, farmer name, why not put it up there so that people are talking about your decaffeinated coffee exactly the same as they are every other coffee? And then you don't have to whisper about it. Mm. I, I, I agree completely. And um, it's a part of hospitality to offer somebody something that they're going to enjoy. And 
if uh, personally speaking, if you don't offer decaf in your establishment, I've seen it in a I've seen it done in a graceful way. It still, to a personal opinion, creates such a problem. I think for hospitality, that's personally, it's just not worth it. And um, we offer lots of things that are, uh, you know, not necessarily what the barista themselves might just celebrate, like coffees that are nutty, if you might not like nutty coffees, but you're still offering other types of coffees in your establishment and creating a range. And that's what coffee shops are all about, is creating a, a, a wide net. And even, you know, in year, recent years, we're casting the net wider. We're trying to become more... Uh, attractive to larger segments of our neighborhoods. And it just seems like the technology is there for great decaf, The um, both in the decaffeination process and the, the machines. And why wouldn't you just lean into it hard and, and celebrate great decaf coffee? I agree. I, I'm uh, excited to have gotten the opportunity to talk to you about this. We're uh, definitely uh, blessed to have a Swiss water producing such amazing decaffeinated coffees. And uh, how can people reach out to you and find out more about what you offer and, and get some in their shops? Yeah. So specifically for Swiss water, if you check out our website, which is swisswater.com, we have product offerings up there. We do primarily sell coffee to importers or brokers who will then sell on to roasters. So if you have existing relationships with an importer, you can just ask whatever importer you work with um, and then they can give you some suggestions about what they keep in stock. And we, we try and keep as many of coffees in stock as, as reasonable according to the time of the year. Um, but yeah, we try and make it easy to find our coffee uh, and the, our website's a great place to start or uh, social media on Instagram. We'll talk about uh, small batch releases or something like that. Awesome. So any last words to uh, specialty coffee retailers out there on decaf? Don't forget about it because it really does represent a large portion of business and they are very loyal customers. So if you can keep them happy, they create word of mouth. They tell other people to come in. And it's definitely not something that needs to be a secretive whisper. There's no, there's nothing to be afraid of with decaf and there's nothing that you need to hide. So just pay attention to it, promote it as you would any other coffee and it's going to taste better. Mike, thank you so much for taking the time today. I really enjoyed talking with you. Yeah, thank you, Chris. It was great. Well, this is one of those conversations I think that needs to be shared with everybody in your company, um, from the owner all the way to the newest hire on the bar, because we all play a part in creating the perception of coffee to the public and the little things that we do or don't do to the coffee based on our perceptions of its quality um, determine its quality in the end. So we don't want to forget about decaf, like Mike said at the end here. And not forgetting about decaf is not just reminding yourself that, hey, there's great quality decaf. It's it's embracing it in the same way that you embrace caffeinated coffee, putting it through the paces you would any of your other coffees on the bar that you're proud of. Um, we have the ability to do this. And when you really dial in your process for decaf specifically, you're making a whole lot of people happy, <laughs> myself included. Because if I visit your bar and it's nighttime... Um, I would love to have an amazing cup of coffee that's that's not caffeinated. And um, the more people listen to this, uh, the better. The more likely it is I'll get a great cup of decaf coffee at night. So maybe this is a, a selfish episode. But um, we need this message out there. And it's so great that we got to hear this from Mike today. Mike, thank you so much for taking the time to share your knowledge about this and your great message. We really appreciate you and all that you do to make decaffeinated coffee amazing at Swiss Water. If you want to uh, learn more about getting Swiss Water decaffeinated coffees in your shop, you can go to SwissWater.com. Now, if you want to reach out to me directly, you can do so by emailing Chris at keys to the shop .com. If you have any questions, comments, or feedback about the show, 
or if you want to inquire about working with Keys to the Shop Consulting to help you optimize your shop's operations, increase your coffee quality, solve problems that you're having on the bar, um, any of those things, let's have a conversation. Chris at keys to the shop.com. And uh, yeah, look forward to hearing from you. Now, I want to remind you all that Coffee Fest is coming up very shortly here. Um, it's going to be happening May 31st through June 2nd in Indianapolis. I'm really excited because this is close to where I live in Louisville, Kentucky. So I'm excited to see all the Midwest representation. And if you're in the area and you want to go to the industry's best trade show for retailers, then Coffee Fest is the place to go. Uh, I would encourage you to go to coffeefest.com, click on the Indianapolis show, get yourself registered, uh, and you're going to experience an amazing time. There's so many resources a lot of great lectures and workshops and trainings and competitions, exhibitors and community. It's, uh, this is probably, I don't know, maybe my 42nd or so, something like around there, uh, Coffee Fest. I've been going that long and I'll be doing some speaking at this event in Indianapolis, but I always love going to Coffee Fest and I know you will too, coffeefest.com. And I hope to see you there. So everyone, that's it for today's episode. Thank you. Thank you for joining me. Uh, May you go forth and make amazing decaf coffee in your shops. Thanks again to Mike over at Swiss Water. Uh, Go to SwissWater.com to get their coffee in your shop. And as always, I hope that this episode has truly given you keys to the shop.